And due to the governor's proclamation 20-28 relating to the COVID-19 emergency and open public meetings, this meeting will be held entirely remotely this evening. So at this point, I'd like to take a moment and do a roll call of the council members that are in attendance. So please stay here when I call your name. Council Member Martz and Deputy Council President Ray have an excused absence this evening. Council Member DeMichelle. Here. Thank you. Council Member Goodman. Here. Council Member Hall. Here. Council President Hunt. Here. And Council Member Walsh. Here. Thank you. We have five of our council members here this evening. The next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would welcome you to join me in it, but I'm also going to ask you to mute. So I'll give you a second to do that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The next item on our agenda this evening is audience comments. And for those of you who have submitted the online form to make your comments, your name will be called shortly. For those who have joined us tonight and would like to make comments but did not sign up in advance, you can raise your virtual hand if you're on the phone by pressing star three. And if you have joined by computer or smartphone, look for a hand icon. This can vary by device. One option may be to go to the participant panel and choose the raise hand icon in the lower right-hand corner. There is also going to be a public hearing tonight on AB 8203, consideration to support best start for kids levy, King County proposition number one. Comments on this topic must be made under the public hearing, which is occurring later in the meeting. And city clerk, has anyone signed up to speak for general audience comments or indicated a desire to speak this evening? Yes. Yeah. So for those making remarks, I want to remind you to please uh, direct your comments to the whole council and not to individuals. And while this is not a question and answer session, we will contact you to follow up if needed. When you are recognized, please unmute your microphone, state your name and address and relationship to the city, and speak clearly and pause frequently. Please limit your comments to five minutes and remute your microphone when you're done. If you do not respond after your name or phone number is called, or if the connection is lost unexpectedly, the meeting will still need to proceed. You're encouraged to rejoin the meeting if able. Personal attacks, obscene language, derogatory remarks, and disruptive behavior will not be permitted. Citizen comments, written and verbal, are an important aspect of the public process, and the city takes these comments seriously, and we thank you for taking the time to address us. City Clerk, can you please identify the first person who has signed up to speak tonight? Yes, the first person who has signed up to speak is Douglas Evans. Douglas, in just a moment, you should see an option to unmute and you may also choose to turn your video on. You have the floor. Thank you. So I'll make this brief. Thank you, uh, Mayor Paul and council members. I did prepare something in writing to try and make this go quickly. I know it's a nice summer evening and no one wants to be sitting in front of their computers doing this on a nice day like today. So I'll try and be brief. So my issue relates to the permit review process and the cost and some of the absurd requirements that are being made to do to replace a boat lift on Lake Sammamish. Uh, I own a small home on Lake Sammamish in the South Cove area. There's a dock and a boat lift. I've owned it for about uh, nine years now. It's a really small house. We use it more of a summer cottage, so it's not a big $5 million mansion. Uh, but last year during a windstorm, uh, we have a canopy over the boat lift and it got caught in the wind and it ended up causing the uh, boat lift itself to be damaged. The canopy now sits halfway in the water, so it's been an eyesore since then. Um, back in March, I went ahead and started the process trying to figure out whether I wanted to replace it or whether I wanted to try and fix it. Because it's so old, it's a water-driven uh, boat lift as well, and we've had issues where the water was left on and uh, had some substantial bills to the water department as a result. We decided to go ahead and replace it. And that's where things have gotten kind of funny. The And I don't know if anybody's ever gone through the permit process at the city 
or any city before, but it's not a very fun process, especially for someone who's kind of a lay person like I am. Um, so far, uh, you know, one of the main things we had to do is get what they call an exemption to the Shoreline Substantial Development Permit. And that's five hundred twenty-five dollars. I understand why they do that. In order to to proceed with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife or the Corps of Engineers, I need that permit though. And so I submitted uh, at the end of April uh, for that permit. I heard nothing. I went online at the uh, about mid uh, June and found out that it had been approved by several of the people that had to do it, but one particular planner wasn't available to do it. I uh, found out she'd been on vacation for a couple of weeks. Uh, after some prodding, I finally, apparently when she got back from vacation, she went ahead and, and did her work on the permit. The problem is that there was 13 conditions assigned to it. A couple of those included getting a building permit, which is not a big deal, except that all the building permits regard, require a topography um, by a surveyor. In uh, checking, I'm looking at another 2,500 to 3,000 for that, and we're eight to 10 weeks out to do that. I'm replacing a lift that is already there. Um, I submitted a bunch of questions and follow up because they also wanted a flood hazard permit. And I got over the next three weeks, got no responses. Um, finally, uh, and I will give a shout out to your director, Minnie uh, Dollywall, because she has been great. Uh, she's talked to me a couple of times today, but I copied her finally on some of the um, on some of the correspondence and she's been great in trying to do some of the work that I think her staff should have done for me. Uh, she's promised to get back to you tomorrow after she's done some more homework on the issue. But I just wanted to kind of let, let the council and the mayor know that this process, you know, for replacing a boat lift has just gotten so cumbersome and so expensive that I understand now why my neighbors were laughing at me when I, when I started the process because they said that no one gets permits for it, even though it's required. And I just, I think, I don't know, I know that the city has limited control with some of the other agencies that are involved in this, but I think you should know that this is just terrible and it's just, and I, and I, and I, and I think most homeowners don't follow the process anymore. So I'll stop with that. I'll let you go on to the more important things in life. But, uh, you know, I do, again, thank you for your director for getting involved and I'm hoping that we'll have some resolution in, in the next couple of days. Thank you, Douglas. Um, very important comments. Glad that you came tonight and shared them with us. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Me too. City Clerk, do we have anyone else signed to speak this evening? Mayor, we have an individual who signed up to make comments under the public hearing. So I'll just um, ask again if there's anyone else on the call who would like to make comments at this time under general audience comments. As the mayor said, you can raise your virtual hand if you're on the phone by pressing star three or on a computer, opening your participant panel and raising your virtual hand. All right, and I don't see that anyone else is indicating a desire to speak. That is great, thank you, city clerk. Um, I want to thank uh, Douglas for coming in this evening. It's especially important to hear these kinds of things when the council is actually looking at Title 18 and other codes right now. So, um, but that was all we had for tonight. Um, just as a reminder, if somebody does want to send comments into the council at any time, they can submit them to city council at issafawa.gov. I also wanted to go to council president Hunt and see if there were any emails that the council president had received related to comments or comments on anything on tonight's agenda topics. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is Council President Hunt. Um, while we've been having virtual meetings, I've been summarizing emails that we received that specifically reference items on our agendas. And on tonight's agenda, we did receive one email that specifically referenced AB 8181, which is the second quarter reports, city work plan, capital projects and performance measurements. And this is an item on consent. In this email, the community member that wrote to us expressed that they disagreed with the foregoing of a formal presentation of the material. And they also provided comments on multiple topics that were related to the work plan. And that concludes emailed comments specifically on tonight's agenda items. Thank you, Council President Hunt. The next item we'll be going to is committee and regional reports. And we'll start tonight with Council Member Hall. Thank you. Uh, this is Councilmember Hall. Uh, two quick reports tonight. 
Um, first for Cascade Water Alliance, uh, Mayor Polly and I attended a, a Cascade Board workshop on Wednesday, June 30th. Um, we were actually presented with a lot of the information that you all asked for, um, including uh, some of the updated water demand projections. Um, you know, feedback that we that we asked from you last month, and um, Cascade staff has agreed to come present at a future study session to be determined. So stay tuned on that. And the next board meeting is next Wednesday, July 28th at 3.30. Um, the next meeting of the Growth Management Planning Council's Affordable Housing Committee is this Wednesday, July 21st at noon. Um, we're gonna be getting a number of briefings that day, uh, including an update on the countywide planning policies that were just adopted by the Growth Management Planning Council. Uh, an update on how partners um, are using their new affordable housing sales tax dollars and an update on what we're calling the Community Partners Roundtable, which is essentially a forum for the community to better engage in the regional work that we're doing as a committee. And uh, with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Next up is Council Member DeMichelle. Thank you, Mayor Polly. Uh, on July 9th, I attended the East Side Transportation Partnership meeting. Uh, Sound Transit presented its realignment plan for comment. And those commenting, including myself, urged Sound Transit not to delay the 405 North project, which includes a significant bus rapid transit implementation. We were pointing out that a delay would adversely impact transit recovery for the entire East Side. During the meeting, we were joined by King County Council President and Sound Transit Board Member Claudia Balducci, who supported our position and said she is working hard to find ways to get the project back on track. There will be important opportunities for council members from Eastside Cities to comment on the Sound Transit realignment during the month of August, and we will keep you informed of those dates and times. On Friday, July the 15th, Sound Transit received a revenue forecast with a $1.4 billion decrease in the affordability gap with the caution that there are still many unknowns and the current gap means that many projects are still unaffordable. However, the conversation at the Sound Transit Board indicated support for moving the Tier 2 projects, which includes the 405 North project, one year forward on the proposed schedule. So uh, this, was, this is an um, item that we will be watching really closely. Also on July 7th and the 13th, I attended meetings of the Eastside Human Service Forum, Legislative Committee, and Executive Search Committee, respectfully, respectively. <laughs> so thank you. That ends my report. Thank you, Councilmember DeMichelle. Next, we have Councilmember Walsh. Thank you. This is Councilmember Walsh. Um, on July 7th, I attended the Puget Sound Regional Council's Economic Development District Board. Um, there we continued the conversation about regional workforce recovery planning um, and talking about the outreach that's going to happen in that um, conversation, especially with um, people who are not uh, involved in the process as much. Um, and then we also received a, an update on the economic development guide, which they are promoting, which similar to the um, K4C toolkit, um, which is meant to, as something that's developed regionally to help um, localities do their own planning. This is uh, for the economic development element of the um, comprehensive plan. And so it's kind of a guide for helping cities and localities create their plan along with some metrics. So I'm really excited about that coming out. Um, and I've already talked to Jen Davis Hayes about it. Um, but we'll see what it is. We just got a presentation that is coming. So uh, that concludes my report. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Walsh. Uh, next up, Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I apologize for my froggy throat. Um, last Thursday, I think that's July 15th, the Eastside Fire and Rescue Board of Directors held a special meeting. Um, during that meeting, the board approved a contract to provide a fire and emergency services to approximately 30 square miles within the city of Woodenville and areas in incorporated, unincorporated King County. Uh, this is really big and exciting news, and it's a great opportunity for Eastside Fire and Rescue, and uh, I'll provide some uh, details now. 
Uh, the first thing is that this is a contract for services between Eastside Fire and Woodenville Fire. There are, would be, um, there are no voting rights or official participation of Woodenville Fire at the Eastside Fire board level. This is a 10-year contract for service with automatic 10-year renewals, terms that match the current partnership um, interlocal agreement. Eastside Fire and Rescue essentially will operate Woodenville Fire using Woodenville Fire's existing personnel, equipment, and facilities. On October 1st, Eastside Fire will begin operating the three Woodenville Fire stations at Woodenville's stated service level and, Woodenville's, and at Woodenville's expense. Woodenville will experience cost savings and Eastside Fire will collect a 10% administrative charge that will be treated as non-partner revenue. Non-partner revenue will go toward reducing Eastside Fire expenses before the remaining expenses are passed on to the partner agencies. For year one, Eastside Fire will collect $1.179 million in non-partner revenue. In addition, Woodenville Fire will be paying for all personnel, operations, equipment replacement, and capital facility charges. The addition of more than $1.1 million in non-partner revenue will go a long way to covering personnel-related cost increases that would otherwise need to be covered by our existing partners, especially in light of the current spike in inflation that we have been experiencing. Woodenville Fire has expressed an interest to Chief Clark in evaluating the possibility of becoming a partner with each site fire in the future. But to do so, there would be several steps. First, Woodenville Fire would need to first um, officially express its interest to the Eastside Fire Board, and then the board would need to direct the chief to conduct a business analysis. And then at the end of that analysis, um, at the conclusion of it, if the board makes a re recommendation to pursue adding Woodenville Fire as a partner to Eastside Fire, then each of the current partner elected bodies would have to consider the request and vote to approve the request for partnership. And then if all five parties approve, then it would come back to the Eastside Fire Board for final approval. This process would take at least a year from the time, time Woodenville Fire decides that it would like to be considered um, to be considered um, for the process as a partner. And again, this is only a contract, and that there's been no um, express interest or intention expressed. Just interest at this time, and it's just a it's just a contract for service. However, um, it is a new contract with Woodenville and it's a tremendous compliment whether or not Woodenville Fire um, actually ultimately um, joins Eastside Fire as a partner. And it speaks volumes for the unique government's, governance model that Eastside Fire has created. And um, I personally think that congratulations, congratulations are in order for the entire Eastside Fire administra administrative um, team that helped um, put this contract together. So that's my big exciting news for the night. Um, Eastside Fire Board will not meet in August. We have a month off, and we will meet, like the, I believe it will be the first Thursday, or first or second Thursday in September. And that's my report. Thanks so much. Exciting news. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Next up, we have Council President Hunt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is Council President Hunt. I have a few reports this evening. The Kokanee ILA Interlocal Agreement Management Committee met on June 28th. Kokanee is a non-migrating type of salmon and they're very important in our region and the Lake Sammamish population of Kokanee is near extinction. So uh, conserving, conserving this population is very important and this group works together to do that. Um, I wanna thank Larry Franks for serving as my alternate at this committee and he served in my place at the meeting. The committee took several actions at the meeting. They approved the 2019 to 2020 ILA biennial report, which documented their deliverables over those two years. And they also approved the 2020 ILA work plan, budget, and cost share. Um, the next meeting of this committee has not yet been set. Then the WIRA 8 Salmon Recovery Council met on July 15th. Um, this is a technical name for our watershed. And the Salmon Recovery Council had two action items. We approved the 2020 WIRA 8 budget and work plan, and we also approved salmon recovery funding board grant round funding recommendations. Um, and I'm happy to report that of those funding recommendations, the Lower Issaquah Creek Stream and Riparian Restoration Project, which was put forward by the city of Issaquah, was recommended for almost the complete amount that was requested. 
it was $450,000 requested for this restoration, and of that, 435235 was what was recommended. Um, so I wanted to thank the City of Issaquah's team for putting together that successful application for that project. Uh, the next meeting of the Wire 8 Salmon Recovery Council will be September 16th. And then lastly, the Title 18 Ad Hoc Committee met on July 8th. This is an ad hoc committee meeting of council members that meets to discuss Title 18, which is our land use code. And we discussed and reviewed the draft design code, which council will be reviewing at our next study session on July 27th. Uh, the next ad hoc council, the next Title 18 ad hoc meeting is scheduled for Thursday, um, July 22nd. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Council President Hunt. Next item on the agenda this evening is the mayor's report. And because we have included those quarterly city reports in the consent calendar, I'm going to be highlighting a few of those items, which will make my report a little bit longer tonight. So first up, there will be an executive session held this evening to discuss pending and potential litigation per RCW 42.30.110 per N1 per NI. This item is expected to last 20 minutes and no action is anticipated at this time to occur in the open session. Uh, it is Parks and Community Services Month. Every day our Parks and Community Services team works to maintain our excellent quality of life here in Issaquah. And with great appreciation for the work they do in serving our community, I have proclaimed July Parks and Community Services Month. Thank you to our Parks and Community Services team for your essential service to our community. Please join me this month in celebrating by taking a hike, enrolling in a program, or just simply picnicking in a local park. The second quarter reports are included on the consent agenda this evening. Um, this is the admin, uh, these reports provide updates to council and to the community on the work we are doing in 2021, as well as providing updates on some performance metrics associated with our city strategic plan. These reports, which the City Council will formally receive through the consent agenda, include the citywide work plan, the capital projects list, the second report on the performance measurement plan. And while there will not be a formal presentation on these reports, I did want to provide a few highlights. For the citywide work plan, which is organized according to our strategic plan, here are the significant updates since the last report in April. In general, there was a sustained progress or improvement for all of the actions on the work plan. The improvement was primarily due to four actions under the growth and development and environmental stewardship goal areas that are associated with the Title 18 update. These four actions shifted from the major challenges classification to on track as that work now progresses. Other highlights from the environmental stewardship goal include the Parks and Community Services Department continues to develop the Green Issaquah Partnership. This collaborative effort between the City of Issaquah, Forterra, and community groups trains volunteers to help steward our forested parks and open spaces. The 20-year implementation guide for the program has been published and is available on the City website. Also, work on the Climate Action Plan began earlier in the second quarter and will create a roadmap for reducing citywide greenhouse gas emissions and preparing for the impacts of climate change. In the mobility goal area, work has resumed on two actions that were previously on hold. The administration is working on the Squat Callus Community Connections Partnership and the Regional Employers Transit Group, which the council received an update on at the June 29th city, uh, council study session. In the social and economic vitality goal area, the healthy community strategy that was on hold has been restructured as a human services strategic plan. This planning effort, which will include the healthy community, housing and homelessness policy conversations, began with a needs assessment to inform future work. And finally, the Snoqualmie Tribe Vaccine Partnership at Lake Sammamish State Park concluded in June. It was very successful. For the capital projects update, in April, 41 of 47 projects were considered on track. Since April, nine of those projects previously considered on track have been reclassified. Three projects are now complete. These include the Southeast 43rd Way signal improvements and two water utility projects, the Forest Rim Reservoirs and Cougar Ridge Isolation Valve. One project, the Newport Way Landside Repair, has been postponed construction from Q3 2021 until 2022. Five other projects are now classified as minor challenges because the project timelines have been delayed by one quarter. 
These projects include the Newport Way improvements from Maple to Sunset, the Northwest Sammamish Road non-motorized improvements, the Southeast 43rd Way and East Lake Sammamish Parkway roundabout project, and the Newport Pedestrian Bridge and Old Town Traffic Calming. From the performance measurement report, the second quarter update contained uh, in Exhibit C presents the changes to seven performance measures based on data from the 2021 Community Survey. The report provides a summary of these high-level outcome measures along with graphics and a brief discussion of trends and performance against internal goals and regional benchmarks. That is a summary of highlights for the um, quarterly reports that were included on the consent calendar. I also wanted to talk about the 2021 Arts Grant. Another item on tonight's consent agenda is AB 8210, the Arts Grants recommendations. And I'd like to highlight the following. The round two arts funding will provide $44,150 for nine projects that will reach broadly across the community through visual, performing, and literary art experiences. Issaquah's art ex organizations are demonstrating creativity and flexibility in how to deliver arts opportunities for the community during the pandemic with an increased usage of technology and virtual programming, trends that are likely to continue for a while. Uh, they are conducting multiple rounds of flexible arts funding, requires less application lead time, and is helping remove barriers for smaller, less formalized community groups. More than 30% of the 2021 arts grants applicants were new to the city's art funding process. That's the last item I'll be reporting out on tonight in the mayor's report. And we will move on to the consent calendar. The consent calendar was distributed to council in advance. And if authorized, the items on the consent calendar will be considered together and approved by one motion. Um, council member D. Michelle, there is a comment or a statement that I believe you would like to make before we move into our approval process. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Polly. I do have a statement. I would like to state for the record that I am currently employed with an entity that is included in the city's payables, Influence the Choice. I currently fill the role of temporary executive director of Influence the Choice. The city serves as a fiscal agent for this agency in the disbursement of a federal fund. Grant funds are being dispersed under this month's accounts payable. I have asked for advice from the city attorney as to whether this warrants a conflict of interest and have been informed that I am not legally required to be excused from voting as the city is carrying out a decision that was previously made by the council. However, for the sake of transparency, I would like to declare this employment and have my statement entered on the minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember D. Michelle. Have the payables and payroll been reviewed? This is Councilmember Hall, they have. Thank you. Does any council member desire to remove any item from the consent calendar and consider it under regular business? And I will turn on my chat, which I have not actually done yet. Okay, I'm not seeing any indication. Um, so is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? And it looks like Council President Hunt, you'd like to make a motion. Thank you. This is Council President Hunt. I move to approve the consent calendar as it appears in this evening's agenda. Thank you. And Council Member Walsh? I'll second that. Thank you. So it, motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent calendar. And I'm going to get the city clerk to do a roll call vote. Yes, yeah, starting with Council Member Walsh. Aye. Council Member D. Michelle. Aye. Council Member Goodman? Aye. Council Member Hall? Aye. Council President Hunt? Aye. That's five ayes, zero nays. Thank you very much. So that passes five to zero. Oh. The next item of business this evening is the public hearing, AB 8203, consideration to support best start for kids levy, King County Proposition 1. This is a regular property tax levy for children, youth, families and communities. Um, there was an informational presentation provided on this topic at the June 21st council meeting. This evening, we will be conducting the public hearing and council will be asked to consider approval of a resolution. Um, 
At the meeting on the 21st, the council directed the administration to prepare a resolution in support of the proposition and to schedule a public hearing for tonight's council meeting. At tonight's public hearing, both proponents and opponents of the proposition will be provided an equal opportunity to make comments. There is not going to be a staff presentation on this item this evening. And before I open the hearing, are there any council member questions? You can add a uh, note in the chat if you would like to be recognized. While I'm waiting to see if anybody has any questions, I also want to let everybody know that Marcy Miller, Seattle and King County's Public Health Policy Manager, will be on hand if the council does have any questions. And it would be great if we would do any questions that you have before we start the public hearing. And I'm not seeing any uh, questions at this point in time. So I will open the public hearing at 731. And I'm asking the city clerk to help manage the time to ensure that we provide an equal opportunity to hear from both opponents and proponents of the proposition. Again, for those of you who have joined us tonight and would like to make comments but did not sign up in advance, please raise your virtual hand. If you're on the phone, that could be press star three. And if you've joined by computer or smartphone, you can look for the hand icon. And this does vary from device to device. One option may be go to the participant panel and choose the raise hand icon in the lower right hand corner. City Clerk, has anyone signed up to speak or indicated a desire to speak this evening? Yes, Kaylee Jake has indicated a desire to speak. Kaylee, in just a moment, I'll move you up as a panelist. You should then have an option to unmute and may also choose to turn your video on. You have the floor. Okay. Hi, um, everyone. Uh, so my name is Kaylee Jake. Uh, I live at 24706 Southeast 30th Street, Sammamish. 98075, and I'm the executive director of the garage at Team Cafe. And um, I wanted to uh, speak to you all tonight to encourage you to, to approve and endorse the renewal of the Best Starts for Kids levy. Um, and I would imagine that you've gotten a lot of, of the statistics and, um, and that kind of information from best starts for kids. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you in a, in a more personal way. Um, you know, our kids are the most vulnerable in my mind, um, in our community. And they often find themselves in situations that they have no control over whatsoever. And a lot of our, um, a lot of our community is able to provide resources um, when they are experiencing challenges, uh, but but some can't, and I feel it's a community's responsibility um, when our when a parent or a guardian is unable to provide those resources for whatever reason. And during COVID, we we have lots of reasons right now, um, and so I feel it again. It's our community's responsibility to provide those resources, and best starts. For Kids has done an incredible job of really building up our youth and creating opportunities for them to thrive. The National Forum of Early Education says that for every dollar you invest in our youth, you yield up to $9 of return. So I want you to think about it, this, this renewal of the levy. It's $872 million. So we're talking upwards of $7 billion dollars that will be returned in, in our investment. It's so worth it. And, and our community knows that kids are worth it. You all support them all the time in so many ways. And this is just another way that we can do that for them. So, um, you know, the garage has increased our mental health counseling and our tutoring by hundreds of percentage points. As we have moved into COVID. And it's just going to get worse, um, the need, uh, as all of our kids go back to school in the fall. And navigating this new normal is really difficult. And I think Best Starts for Kids just continues to provide opportunities for organizations like The Garage that are working to ensure that our, our youth are thriving, um, which is really important to our community and keeps it the amazing place that we all want it to be. So I, I 
strongly, strongly encourage you to endorse this. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. City Clerk, is there anyone else signed up to speak this evening or indicating a desire to speak? Yes. Uh, Dila Pereira would like to make comments. Dila, in just a moment, I'll move you up as a panelist. You will then have the option to unmute and can choose to turn your video on. You have the floor. Dila, we're not able to hear you. You can hear me now. Great. Um, my name is Dila Pereira, and I'm volunteering as the campaign co-chair for the renewal of Best Starts for Kids. And Mayor Polly, Council President Hunt, members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and to seek your support for the renewal of Best Starts for Kids. I think Kaylee spoke so eloquently about the impact of the garage and the work that they've been doing to promote mental health in Issaquah and around Issaquah. And I really can't, um, I can't add any more to that and to say that part of the reason I'm volunteering in the role that I am is that I'm the executive director of an organization that promotes maternal health. And I can tell you just how much of an impact Best Starts for Kids has had on us and our ability to provide services to pregnant and parenting families throughout the East Side and including in King County communities like Issaquah. One of the things that I know that Best Starts has done just in the last year in 2020 was that Best Starts for Kids was able to reach a thousand children and youth living in the 98027 and 98029 zip codes. So far, nearly half a million children and youth have benefited from BSK programs. Over 24,000 healthcare providers and other essential workers were supported by BSK programs. And as Kaylee mentioned, I am certain that the ability of our children and youth in our communities to weather the COVID-19 pandemic is greater because of the services and support that Best Starts for Kids has been able to provide. That's why it's essential that Best Starts for Kids is renewed on our ballots. And that is why we're seeking your support. One of the greatest things that Best Starts for Kids has done is to expand mental health supports and school-based health programs, which are going to be essential before, they were essential before the pandemic, they were essential during, and they will be essential after for years to come as we recover from the trauma that our children and our communities have experienced. Renewal continues outreach and partnerships for these types of healthcare centers for pregnant and parenting families, and programs for youth. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is that the renewal will help to provide 3,000 low-income families with access to childcare. And that is going to be critical for economic recovery, family stability, and gender equity, especially for the moms who had to leave the workforce during the pandemic. Levy dollars have already helped over 10,000 families to avoid homelessness. And renewal will continue rental assistance and prevention strategies that Eastside partners like HopeLink, Youth Eastside Services, Friends of Youth, and others are using to prevent homelessness throughout the county. As a leader of a community-based organization, I know firsthand that we as community organizations rely on strong government partnerships to tackle multifaceted challenges like homelessness. It has to be a county-wide effort that will continue with strong examples in communities like Issaquah, Bellevue, and throughout the county. So now is the time to continue this groundbreaking levy success and to continue the, transform, the transformative work that it started and to bring services to even more families in Issaquah and around the county. We would be honored if the Issaquah City Council joined Executive Doug Constantine, along with every county council member, mayors and organizations serving children and families across the county to support the renewal of Best Starts for Kids. As the Seattle Times wrote in their endorsement, Best Starts for Kids has made a difference in the lives of hundreds of thousands of children, young adults, and families. It deserves to be renewed. Thank you. Thank you, Dila. City Clerk, is there anyone else indicating a desire to speak this evening? Mayor, uh, we took about seven minutes of 
comments in support of the proposition. So now is an opportunity for anyone on the call in opposition or additionally in support to make comments. I see a few members of the public. If you'd like to make comments, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star three or uh, finding the small raise hand icon in the participant panel or elsewhere on your device. And I'm just taking a quick look here. And I'm not seeing anyone else indicated a desire, desire to speak. Thank you for that and checking to see that we had uh, fair access for both those in favor and those opposed to the measure. Uh, so if there is no objection to closing the public hearing, so I'm checking in and if I don't hear any, We'll move to close. You can use the chat if you opposed. Hearing none, the public hearing is closed at 7.41 p.m. And uh, is there a council member that would like to make a motion? Looking in the chat, not able to see him. Okay, there we go. Council member, uh, Council President Hunt. Thank you. This is Council President Hunt. I move to approve resolution number 2021-11, supporting King County Proposition number one, regular property tax levy for children, youth, families, and communities, best starts for kids initiative. And Council Member D. Michelle? I second the motion. Thank you. Is there any council discussion? And I'll be looking in the chat to see if anybody would like to make comments. Give it another second. Council President Hunt. Thank you, this is Council President Hunt. I am uh, supportive. I think that this initiative has supported many families and individuals and um, should be allowed to continue the good work that it's doing in our communities. So I'll keep it brief, but supportive of this. Thank you very much. Is there any other discussion, any other comments? Council Member D. Michelle? Uh, I too will be supporting this motion. And uh, as has been stated uh, very eloquently, this, um, this uh, levy has done enormous good for a great number of young people in our county who have needed that support. Um, and as Executive Jake said, um, the need is even greater at this point because of the past year and what that impact has been on youth mental health and um, also uh, joblessness among parents that is impacting young people uh, significantly, uh, so many needs. And um, I think it's justified to renew it and to renew it at a high, higher rate. So I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member D. Michelle. Looking in the chat to see if there are any other council members who would like to discuss or make a comment. And I will give it a few more seconds. So the motion on the floor is to move to approve resolution number 2021-, oh, sorry, Council Member Goodman, I was a little too quick. Wow, oh, sorry. Um, so I um, wanted to just briefly explain um, why, I was not, why I'm not going to vote in support. Um, I'm just um, really not comfortable as the ordinance as is that, um, as in the, our packet says to urge voters to vote in support. Um, I think I'm really feeling more comfortable preferring that voters do their own reading and their own research and decide for themselves rather than um, relying on, on us because that's a little bit what the effect of this is. Um, I, we've seen, we have seen and I have seen a lot of uh, data points, um, a lot of numbers. Um, not nearly as much in terms of outcomes. And that's not to say that um, it's not been um, positive or helpful or good, um, but I would prefer to let voters make up their own mind 
The Seattle Times has published a couple of articles and also um, an editorial. So it's pretty easy for voters to do a little bit of their own reading for themselves. Um, for themselves. So, um, so that's really the only reason that I'm not going to support it, um, because I really think that with something this large um, and with uh, um, two or three hundred dollars, it could cost, um, you know, even a nine hundred thousand dollar poem in the area. I really think that people should make their voters should make up their own minds. So that's why I'm going to be supporting. No. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. I'll give it another 30 seconds or so to see if there is any other council member who would like to participate in the discussion or make a comment. And I won't rush at this time. Okay, not seeing any others. The motion on the floor is to move to approve resolution number 2021-11, supporting King County proposition number one, Regular Property Tax Levy for Children, Youth, Families, and Communities, Best Starts for Kids Initiative. And City Clerk, do you want to do a roll call vote? Yes, starting with Councilmember Member Michelle. Aye. Council Member Goodman. No. Council Member Hall. Aye. Council President Hunt. Aye. Council Member Walsh. Aye. Aye. That's four ayes, one nay. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes four to one. And the next item of business this evening on the agenda under regular business is AB 8161, Council Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. And the action before Council this evening will be to adopt the ordinance, approve the resolution. And this topic was last before Council at the April 5th Council meeting. And I'd like to invite City Clerk Tisha Geezer to present this item. Thank you, Mayor. Give me just a moment to share my screen. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, my name is Tisha Geezer, city clerk. I'm going to uh, share a brief summary of the uh, recommendation of the Council Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee and uh, expect that committee members uh, may choose to elaborate on the presentation and respond um, to questions. So the ad hoc committee was established by the city council at the April 5th council meeting. This was uh, in response to some um, items related to the city council rules of procedure that were discussed at the January 30th council retreat and the March 29th study session, which led to the council um, delegating a recommendation on uh, four items uh, to the council rules ad hoc committee. The committee was established of council members um, D. Michelle, Goodman, and Walsh. Uh, there was not a chair uh, designated among the three. As I mentioned, four items were referred to the committee initially, with a fifth item, the council business new, the city council new business request process, being referred to the ad hoc committee at the May third council meeting. Um, all five items were uh, determined to be reported back um, with a recommendation from the committee at the July 6th meeting. Because that meeting was canceled, um, the recommendation is being provided tonight. Uh, here is a list of the five items that the committee provided a recommendation on. Uh, there's a note here that uh, as uh, you'll hear in just a few moments, um, there were also some uh, suggestions made regarding hybrid meetings and some uh, miscellaneous cleanup items throughout the council rules uh, at the recommendation of the clerk's office. 
And now I'll provide a real brief uh, summary of the uh, recommendation made on each of these items. Um, so one of the um, items referred was a potential for a council member agenda bill liaison role. Um, let me just stop here to say that um, on all of these items, uh, the uh, ad hoc committee um, reviewed the input that they had heard from their colleagues on these topics, and in some cases, um, looked to city staff to provide some additional information about city processes um, or best practices. Um, so with that, um, regarding the agenda bill liaison role, uh, the committee at this time recommends that um, that not be added to the council rules uh, again at this time. The second item referred to the committee was regarding um, creating more clarity around touch points for council study sessions and uh, specifically also um, providing a, a requiring a process for summarizing council feedback and consensus provided at council study sessions. In response, the committee recommended uh, the addition of a sentence to the study session section that states that the uh, presiding officer of a study session or a staff that they designate uh, will provide a summary of the council consensus or feedback received at a study session. And the committee also um, provided some uh, suggestions to the administration, some guidelines uh, regarding the study session process. So there aren't any specific uh, changes proposed to the rules other than the minor change I mentioned. Um, but there was some feedback and, and direction provided um, essentially to, to stick with the process of uh, moving policy items through uh, council study sessions, so starting them as an ID at a study session rather than as an agenda bill. And there was a request that um, if the administration needs to depart from that process, uh, which is often due to a time-sensitive issue, um, that that needs to be clarified in the written materials. Uh, there was also a request to um, increase communication um, on these processes, I, of the sense being that at times um, this information about exceptions might be communicated to some council members, such as the council leadership, but may not um, be shared with all council members in advance. Um, those specific guidelines are included in the committee's recommendation, which is attached to the agenda bill. The third item was regarding um, guidance on boards and commissions and the city council's interaction with the advisory boards and commissions. Uh, the committee discussed this and felt that um, there wasn't necessarily a need for any new process here, but a better, better communication and documentation of um, the existing processes related to the city interacting with the boards and commissions. And so you'll see a new section seven in the council rules that talk a little bit about the uh, city council's role in the confirmation of appointments, um, methods of communicating or sort of monitoring the work plans of the boards and commissions and communicating with the respective staff liaisons on items of interest. And then also clarifying the ability of the council um, as a group at study sessions to potentially relay questions for boards and commissions to consider. Um, again, the specific language is provided in the draft rules that are attached the new section seven. The fourth item was to address the ands and ors throughout the council rules. There were five that the committee um, removed and just provided some alternative language. Uh, two instances were left as is, and these are the instances that refer to the council president and or mayor um, approving agenda items. And they are essentially quotes of uh, a provision in the is a municipal code, modifying them would require an ordinance. And the committee uh, felt that it was a, a, a bit more of a uh, considerable change than the other instances. And so um, proposed leaving those two cases as is. The fifth item that the committee provided a recommendation on is the council new business request process. And because it's been a couple of months since the uh, council received an uh, summary on that process, I just wanted to quickly provide a few slides from that May 3rd presentation, which uh, summarizes this process, which is essentially that a form is submitted by a council member. Uh, there is some written material provided to be included in the agenda packet, 
in that form and a verbal presentation is provided um, under a new new business uh, section of the council agenda, which would fall before good of the order. At that time, after the verbal presentation, the council would um, would vote whether to approve uh, proceeding to the next step with that additional work plan item, that next step being step two, the returning proposal. Uh, this would get the item on the next uh, council agenda and would allow staff the opportunity to uh, provide a bit of a response um, to what the city is doing, um, other considerations for this item. After that second touch point by the council, there would be another opportunity to vote to approve moving the item forward. If there was a majority of the council supporting that, then the item would become an additional work plan item and be scheduled appropriately. Uh, this slide shows a form, a potential form um, used for the council new business request process. At this time, we have a, a form drafted on the city website that would be specifically for city council members to use. The form would need to be submitted seven days in advance of the next council meeting, so um, to be included on that agenda. So the uh, ad hoc committee uh, reviewed this process and did make some changes. Um, one of those changes, um, and this was an addition since your packet was produced, was adding a policy question to the guidelines um, to just prompt that to be one of the topics that's addressed by the requesting council members is what is the policy question. Um, other changes were to identify some other options the council has to add a new business item. Um, and these are these have always been options, amending the council agenda or providing direction under a uh, an existing work plan item that's related to a next step or an element of that item. So those are now called out in the policy. And the policy was also, the committee also recommend the policy be clear that this is a preferred process, but it doesn't preempt any other ability of the council to um, add a, a, an item to a meeting agenda or otherwise. And then um, on to the two additional items. These weren't directly referred to the committee, but given the timeliness of um, uh, just the COVID-19 pandemic and the, you know, the shift to by some agencies to in-person meetings, um, uh, we suggested the committee um, consider hybrid meetings and they asked that the discussion be brought forward to the full council due to the impacts, not only to the council, but to the public. And so that is the next item on the council agenda this evening. And lastly are some minor cleanup provisions. Um, these are brought forward by the clerk's office. Um, they are, are very minor in nature um, and just are some cleanup provisions to document current practice um, and uh, really truly cleanup provisions. So with that, um, the recommendation tonight by the ad hoc committee is to approve the proposed revised rules and uh, also adopt uh, an ordinance which would uh, make the corresponding changes that are needed to um, the order of business. The city council's regular meeting order of business is established in the municipal code. So this change would add the new business section and make some other minor cleanup provisions. And that concludes um, my presentation, Mayor, and it may be that the other uh, committee members would like to add something additional. That is great. Thank you, City Clerk. I also want to thank you and Chief of Staff Tina Eggers for actually getting this original document put together a few years ago. We were really working in the woods for a really long time. So thank you for that. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so ad hoc committee members, would you like to add some comments uh, before we go to uh, questions and answers? If so, if you want to indicate for me in the chat, that'd be great. And if not, oh, there we go. Council Member De Michelle. Well, I'll just add uh, that it was a really good process, a lot of discussion, and thanks to Tina and Tisha and to uh, Wally Bobkowitz as well for supporting us uh, through uh, the process of discussing these items one by one in really logical order. And so I uh, really appreciate all of the support we got. Thank you. That is great. Any other uh, comments from ad hoc? I am going to also open it up to questions for the non ad hoc members as well. 
Okay, well, let's do Q&A before we get to the um, motion. So Councilmember Hall has a question. Thank you, this is Councilmember Hall. Just a quick clarifying question. So this new section seven on um, boards and commissions, is this just existing practice, but just we wanted to document it um, so that way it's written down? Is that right? And if not, uh, correct me, but that's what I thought I heard. Disha? Uh, Mayor, I'll give a short answer and then I see Councilmember Walsh has a comment, so she may want to add to my response, but it, it, it is essentially um, so, some of the practices, um, the sort of bulleted points about how a council member can um, monitor the work of a board of commission by reaching out directly to the staff liaison um, or providing the uh, direct uh, sort of ask of the boarding commission at a study session. Those have been things that have been communicated and done, uh, but just haven't been in a written policy. Great. And Councilmember Walsh. Thanks, Councilmember Walsh. Um, I, I just want to say it kind of also came out of a conversation of what should be the process of putting um, an idea through the board and commission and council and kind of when should council put its ideas out there. And so we wanted to be cautious about the idea of, well, the we want the council to be able to ask questions of board so that the council gets its questions asked and doesn't have to punt it back to a board because that's not the ideal situation, not respectful and not great for time. We also didn't want to presuppose, you know, what we were going to think about it. And so part of it was just a, a caution of if you're going to ask questions, the goal isn't to lead the conversation. The goal is to make sure that there are questions that are considered um, so that the council can have answers. Um, and so that was just part of the, the conversation about that particular point. Thank you, Councilmember Walsh. It also um, helps avoid having to redo a public hearing when the public's primary opportunity might be at a border commission. You're making sure that questions that you know are going to come to mind are getting dealt with, which is great. Um, I do not see any other comments. I'll give it a few more seconds. I do see Councilmember Goodman's ready to make a motion. No additional questions or comments. Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Goodman here. I would um, move to approve resolution number 2021-12, amending the city council rules of procedure to amend various sections as recommended by the council rules of procedure ad hoc committee, including adding a new section 4.17, new business request, and section 7, boards and commissions, and adopt ordinance number 2945, amending IMC 2.06.110, adding new business as an order of business at city council meetings and identifying certain orders of business as only being used as needed. Thank you. And council member Walsh. Second. Great. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Again, I'll be looking at the chats. Chat. Council Member Goodman. Okay, I put it in chat. Uh, <laughs> Council Member Goodman here. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Council Member Guy Michelle said, and um, this was just a it, it was just a great um, committee process and experience, in my opinion. We um, talked a lot. We talked thoroughly. We talked in detail. We had some. Um, I don't know that I would call them difficult conversations, but I think we talked things out um, very well and listened to each other. And um, and we, we just had great um, leader guidance, I would say, and from um, the clerk's office and from um, city administrator. So I'm, um, I do enthusiastically support this and I do um, support all of the specific um, changes that are being made. Thank you very much. The only reason I make you use the chat is because my script covers all of your faces. <laughs> I can't see you. 
Uh, Council President Hunt. Thank you. This is Council President Hunt. I wanted to thank the members of the ad hoc committee that worked on this. I think a lot of thought um, went into the work that you did, and that really shows. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing especially how the new, um, the clarifications about how to have a new business item, um, how that works out. I think it makes um, clarifications that will be really useful to us going forward. Uh, we could previously have, there were ways that council could advance a new business item previously, but it wasn't as clear from our rules of procedure how one would go about doing that. And so I think these clarifications are going to be really useful to us and I will be supporting this. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm going to uh, reread the motions. Uh, make sure I haven't missed anybody. So it's been moved and seconded to approve resolution number 2021-12, amending the city council rules of procedure to amend various sections as recommended by the council rules of procedure ad hoc committee, including adding a new section 4.17, new business requests and section seven boards and commissions and adopt Ordinance number 2495, amending IMC 2.06.110, adding new business as an order of business at city council meetings, and identifying certain orders of business as only being used as needed. And I'm going to ask the city clerk to do the roll call vote. Yes, yeah, starting with council member Goodman. Aye. Council member Hall. Aye. Council president Hunt. Aye. Council Member Walsh? Aye. And Council Member D. Michelle? Aye. That's five ayes, zero days. Thank you. That passes unanimously 5 0. We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is AB 8204, City Council Hybrid Meetings Plan. And uh, we're looking for some direction for the administration. And this is the first time that this item is coming before Council. I'd like to invite our City Clerk back to present this item. Tisha? Yes, hey, this is uh, Tisha Geezer, city clerk again. Um, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the city pro city's proposed hybrid meetings plan and its uh, impacts to our city council meetings. So uh, we have been doing these remote meetings for a while. Um, as you recall, the uh, COVID-19 uh, state of emergency was declared at the very end of February 2020, and the following month, the governor issued Proclamation 20-28, which uh, prohibited any in-person meeting of an entity that falls under the Open Public Meetings Act, which includes the city council and our boards and commissions. Um, initially, uh, if you recall, the city council was restricted on what sort of issues it could consider at its uh, remote meetings, and, and then it expanded to be, become our norm. Uh, this past legislative session, the legislature uh, formally ratified this Proclamation 20-28, which means it's currently in effect um, until rescinded by the legislature or until the state of emergency uh, is ended. The proclamation has been modified numerous times throughout COVID, and eventually the proclamation did allow for um, in person, an in-person component uh, to meetings, depending on the uh, phase of the governor's uh, safe start uh, plan. However, there were numerous restrictions around uh, the and safety requirements around that in-person component. Um, throughout COVID and today, um, there is a required remote meeting component to all meetings of ent entities that fall under the OPMA. Um, but as of June 30th, uh, a number of those in-person meeting component restrictions have been uh, reduced. And so currently, uh, and this slide is intended to sort of show this point in time summary, uh, currently there is not a social distancing requirement for an in-person component of a meeting, um, nor is there an occupancy uh, requirement. Given this, um, the city is interested in pursuing uh, transitioning to hybrid virtual in-person meetings. A couple of the other um, boxes shown on this slide um, show the sort of masks 
status as of today for these meetings. Um, the city staff, including city council members, um, must meet the labor and industry mask standards, which means that any of us who have shown proof of vaccination can be unmasked at these meetings. Uh, for the public, um, I should say, so for staff who, and council members who don't share that status, they would be wearing a mask. And uh, for members of the public who are uh, unvaccinated, they would also be required to wear a mask. However, the city is not required to uh, view proof of their vaccination status. So it would essentially be an honor system. Under our proposed hybrid meeting plan, um, we would have some signage at the entrance to the meeting rooms that we would be using for these meetings, um, providing this information and uh, free masks. We also uh, are not required, but are encouraged to provide a sort of a sign-up sheet that the members of the public would fill out um, in the event that contract tracing was needed. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, there would not be any capacity or, or social distancing requirements. So our current um, proposal is to transition to this hybrid virtual in-person meeting, um, beginning with the count city council study session on July 30th and at all uh, city council meetings from then on. And you'll be hearing more about our proposed plans for the city's boards and commissions um, at the July 27th council study session. Um, but I will mention that um, we are working to um, retrofit uh, two facilities currently for either city council or board and commission use, and that is the city council chambers and Tibbetts Creek Manor. Uh, so what does uh, this meeting type look like? Well, uh, the city council chambers do look a little differently. Um, the municipal court has uh, been uh, operating throughout COVID and have uh, initiated a number of virtual um, protocols. And so there is some different equipment in the room, but by and large, the room looks very similar to how it did pre-COVID. And the city council members in attending a, a regular council meeting would, as usual, be seated, seated up at the dais with staff and members of the public down on the floor and to the side. Uh, for this virtual meeting, uh, the room being used would essentially be one member of the WebEx event. So we would schedule a uh, WebEx event just like we do now, and the council chambers would be one of the attendees. The in-room video would be controlled by ICTV staff, just as it was pre-COVID, which means sometimes there'd be a wide shot of the room and all council members, uh, or there would be a close-up on the council member speaking or the staff or member of the public speaking. The ICTV staff would also be handling the in-room audio. So this means that city council members would not need to even bring a laptop necessarily and certainly would not need to join um, the WebEx event. The city clerk's office um, and ICTV staff would be managing the virtual aspect of the meeting. For those who are attending virtually, such as members of the public, um, city staff, and potentially uh, council members, they would show up as an entity in a virtual meeting just like they do today, and they would be viewable in the council chambers or the Tibbetts Creek Manor, either from the screen that's behind the council members at the dais or from the small and from the small screens in front of each council member. Uh, any presentations would also be viewable uh, there as well. So what this means is it would be a return to some of our in-meeting protocols. Um, so we wouldn't be using chat to indicate a desire to speak, but rather a return to the lifting of the microphones. Uh, similarly, we could return um, to voice votes. It may be that if there's some remote participation, particularly by council members, that we would have some modified um, protocols. For the um, WebEx events portion, I think I just, hopefully I described that um, fairly well. Um, the idea would be to sort of focus on the council chambers as much as possible, assuming that most of the um, council attendees are uh, in person. And as I mentioned, uh, city staff would be managing um, the virtual meeting components. I want to talk about a little bit about the proposed plans meeting attendance. Um, the council, if you recall, you amended your rules of procedure back in September of 2020. And so now they state that uh, council members may attend meetings remotely uh, while the city has, is in a state of emergency. So it's tied to the city's emergency declaration. Um, 
Of course, as I mentioned earlier, currently everyone is able to attend meetings remotely uh, while uh, Proclamation 20-28 is in place. Uh, as a reminder, the council rules say if you're attending remotely, you'll provide advance notice, ideally five days, and then there's some um, specifics around how you'll participate in the meeting. We are proposing both now and moving forward that city staffing consultants or other outside presenters could attend remotely uh, or in person to present to the council, and certainly the public could have the option to attend in person or uh, virtually. And their virtual participation would very closely resemble how it is today. Uh, in addition to us uh, looking for your um, endorsement of our proposed hybrid meetings plan, uh, we also just wanted to sort of share the perspective that we feel that the public participation um, remotely is beneficial to the community. We feel that uh, there has been a strong, consistent, if not strong, participation by the public in this virtual meeting format. We've also made investments in technology, equipment, um, staff training, and feel that it, um, it, it would be fairly easy to continue this remote meeting aspect um, not just now, but even into the future. So again, our, our basic ask tonight is endorsement of this plan to move to the hybrid meeting format on July 30th, but there are some additional options here. Um, you could let us know that you would prefer to stay remote um, while you can for the foreseeable future uh, while the state of emergency is in place. Uh, you could also direct us to um, pursue sort of increasing the city council's ability to participate remotely beyond the state of emergency. Uh, similarly, with the public, um, we could um, sort of, you could provide direction for us to formalize that remote participation by the public in the city council rules of procedure. Uh, or we can, uh, you can choose to let us know that you would like to have those conversations, um, but maybe once we sort of have an end of sight. At this point in time, we have not been able to get any indication of when, of the, when the state of emergency uh, will be terminated. And here again um, is our proposed recommendation tonight. And uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, City Clerk. Uh, it looks like Council Member Hall has a question. Uh, thank you, Council Member Hall here. Just a quick one. And uh, first, thank you very much uh, for all the hard work that went into um, putting together this proposal. Really appreciate it. Um, and it does seem like the direction a lot of other jurisdictions are going. But my question is just with um, a lot of, you know, you've got it laid out here. And I just want to confirm that we would have the staff capacity, whether ICTV or, or city staff, um, to manage a hybrid work plan. Thank you, Council Member Hall. Um, yes, at, you know, at this, as I mentioned, this has become our, our norm and we've made uh, numerous investments um, to make this happen. So certainly in the near term, and as I mentioned, it looks like City Administrator Bob Quitz might have a comment here. We, we do feel like we could manage this for the City Council um, on an ongoing basis. City Administrator, did you want to add? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, good evening. Uh, Thanks to uh, the, the city clerk uh, and our, our IT staff, they're doing a tremendous job. I guess I just want to add the caveat that, you know, this is a lot of work. Um, and this is certainly a dimension that we didn't have uh, 15 months ago uh, through our talents and staff. Uh, they have made it as easy as possible. Um, I am concerned that once we're back in the room, there's going to be a lot of things to juggle. And so uh, I guess I would just put the caveat there that we want the experience to be uh, as similar to the previous experience before March 2020 as possible, but there's a lot more components. And so we'll do our best. I think we've, we're, we're leveraging technology uh, to the greatest extent possible, but there still is human beings that are needed uh, to make all this run. And so we'll keep the council posted. Uh, I think the timing of this will give us uh, a, a nice dry run um, uh, at a, a regular meeting on August 2nd. That'll give us a, a few weeks to to work on any issues that arise. So as we go into the September, lots of meetings, budget, uh, some land use things coming up toward the end of the year, uh, we're going to need to be as nimble as possible. So um, I just added that caveat, but the work that, uh, uh, that the city clerk has done, the work that our IT staff, our 
our TV uh, staff have done has been outstanding. Thank you, City Administrator. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. I'll give it a few seconds. And if somebody is intending to make a motion, please let me know that in the chat as well. Council Member Walsh with a comment and a question. I guess I'm trying to decide if I want to, I guess I can wait until after the motion because it's kind of a discussion point. So I'll wait. Uh, relevant to the motion or something else? Something different? Um, well, relevant to the conversation, but not necessarily, it's not an amendment to the motion or anything like that. Okay. Uh, let's go to Council President Hunt. Thank you. This is Council President Hunt. I move to direct the administration to proceed with the proposed hybrid in-person virtual meeting plan as presented and return to the City Council with minor modifications to the City Council rules of procedure to reflect the ability of the public to make comments virtually on an ongoing basis. And Council Member Hall? I'll second that motion. That's great. Um, Councilmember Walsh, would you want to start this conversation then, or do you want me to go to the motion maker? Start with the motion maker. Okay. Council President uh, Hunt, did you have any comments? Um, thank you. This is Council President Hunt. I do think that having um, the public be able to make virtual um, comments and to attend meetings virtually will allow more um, people that aren't able to in per to come in person to, to participate in the process. And so I think that um, is, a, is a benefit. I also thank all the staff that I know it will be extra work um, as the Administrator Bob Quitz mentioned, it's, it's a lot of work to make that um, happen. So I appreciate that. And um, I, I do think it's beneficial for people that um, have to work in, you know, at their job site in close proximity to the time of the meeting, for example, they can't physically get here, they would still be able to comment. And there are many sorts of circumstances like that. So I think um, I think this would benefit those folks while still allowing people that can come to comment in person to come in person. Um, so I think uh, those would be my comments on the in-person public participation point. I also think that um, there may be Times where council members, um, due to unforeseen circumstances and sort of rare but reasonable uh, exceptions to the rule, might be considered to um, attend virtually. So I'd be interested to hear what my fellow council members think about that. I understand that in person um, is, is is much easier to facilitate a good conversation in person, and I I understand that. Um, I also think there might be exceptions to that that we could consider. And I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, all of my fellow council members think on this, including council member Walsh, who I know has a comment. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna give council member Hall seconder a chance to comment if he wants to, and then I'll go to council member Walsh. Uh, sure, this is council member Hall. And just real quick, um, uh, all of your cameras have turned off on my screen. I seem to be experiencing hmm. some internet difficulties at the moment. So I'm just gonna assume you're all still there. Um, I heard uh, the council president Hunt's comments though, uh, and I agree. I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to um, bring in some best practices um, from the pandemic in terms of how are we breaking down barriers for people to participate in the public process. Um, so um, very uh, encouraged uh, to see that as part of this proposal. Um, and then also, I mean, the same goes for city staff's ability to not return home past midnight. So um, I see that also as a net benefit too. Um, I will be supporting the motion this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Hall. Councilmember Walsh? Thank you. Um, so much like uh, Council President Hunt and Councilmember Hall, I appreciate the, uh, the increase in potential increase in engagement um, for public being able to attend virtually, whether that's parents who have to care for children or people who have to work. I also um, think this is a great opportunity to support our staff um, in not having to stay late, not only 
after their working hours, but into the night um, for meetings for the most part. Um, I guess the the area that I'm looking to have a discussion on is um, council members and kind of that virtual attendance, because I think we've seen in certain cities around the region that, you know, they've run into some problems with this, um, whether it was, you know, people moving out of the area or going on extended vacations and things like that. Um, and so I'm wondering what we're looking at as a way to kind of pre-handle some of those situations, whether it would be a limited number of um, virtual meetings or only by, you know, late notice or something like that. Um, I think in general, it, we've certainly handled virtual quite well um, from staff and council member um, experience, but I wonder how that would work if it's just one council member um, off to the side. And so I wonder what um, what other council members think, because I'm not, I think it's a, it could be a good opportunity, but I see some potential pitfalls that I wanna make sure we're uh, considering. Thank you, Councilmember Walsh. I'm gonna to look to Councilmember D. Michelle or Goodman to see if they wanna comment before we circle back around. Uh, Councilmember D. Michelle and then Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Polly. Uh, just just some uh, general comments. Um, I've personally been experiencing hybrid meetings for about four weeks now with the Kiwanis Club of Issaquah has been doing it. And uh, City Administrator Bob Skowitz is, is absolutely right. It takes a lot more time setting up the technology and making sure the technology is working well and everybody can hear each other. Um, but that said, the meetings have gone surprisingly well. We have between 25 and 35 um, people who attend those meetings and we've been able to hold conversations and uh, discussions and uh, small group get togethers. And we've done many things through the hybrid method and uh, they've worked well and we've had uh, ability for all of us to talk to each other. So I think this is gonna go better than we think it might. Uh, and I also think it's a learning experience, just like when we first got on virtual meetings, we're going to be learning for the first few meetings uh, that we're doing hybrid. So um, I do think that if there's anything good that came out of the COVID-19 experience for us, it was the fact that more and more people have been able to participate in government. And I, I understand, my understanding is that the state legislature has definitely pledged that they will be doing hybrid meetings well into the future so that people across the state can participate uh, in the deliberations in Olympia. And I think uh, there are many, many options for allowing more people to participate in our meetings. So I, I really support this. Um, in terms of um, council member, uh, Council members uh, coming in remotely in the future. Uh, I think uh, Councilmember Walsh raises a lot of good questions. I think there are. I think we should just carefully define the circumstances under which uh, we can have that option. But I think there are some uh, cases where it would be very appropriate, and again, allow for more participation. Uh, even among council members in meetings that they might not be able to attend otherwise. Um, so I think that if we could proceed forward with defining what uh, what those um, circumstances are that we think are appropriate for remote attendance, I think it would be a good thing for us to explore. Um, so I would support uh, doing that in the future as well. So I support the motion and and I I think we're we're venturing into brand new territory. Here we go again. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember D. Michelle. Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Here, um, I support the definitely support um, the allowing the public to um, participate um, in these remote ways. I think that's been great, and I would hope that we would continue that. 
Um, it's, you know, also people don't sometimes can't leave their house, can't get down to council chambers. So it's not just um, whether they have to take care of the kids or they're um, working late or something. Some people just can't leave. And if we don't have the remote option, then they can't participate. In terms of council members, um, uh, my thought is, and it's not set in stone, but my I kind of feel like council members should attend in person um, when they're in town. And I think if we're on vacation, generally we're on vacation. Um, I'm not at this point super supportive of providing a whole lot of flexibility to council members. That so said, um, you know, there's a lot in the news about um, states that are having to mask up again and the Delta variant. And so we don't know that this is going to be where we're going to be in another eight weeks or three months or whatever it is. I, it's just very hard to predict. So um, as we move forward towards the idea of hopefully getting back to normal, um, those would be my thoughts once we're back to, to normal. Um, um, you already know that I can't attend that retreat on the 30th um, because I had something else on my calendar. Um, so I would appreciate being able to monitor that remotely, um, but we're not quite to September yet. So hopefully um, you'll allow me to do that. But I think when we're all done and out of the emergency state and we are comfortable being back to normal and being in person, I do think that council members when they're in town should go to the meetings. And I think that would probably eliminate most of the concerns about moving away and extended vacations and things like that. Anyway, those are just my thoughts for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. City Clerk, I have a question for you, and that is um, there was several changes recommended and then a discussion about um, council member at in-person attendance. What do you need from the council this evening on council member in-person attendance? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've been making notes of your comments, and I think um, what we would propose is returning at a at a future meeting, uh, potentially a potentially a study session um, or council meeting to put together a proposal um, on the council remote attendance. So I don't th think there needs to be a modified motion at this time. I've noted the feedback. That is great. Thank you very much. Um, Councilmember Hall, I see that you are not going to be making a comment right now, and I'm just looking to see if there are any more comments or questions before someone would like to make a motion. If you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Okay. And Mayor, this is Tissa to clarify that the motion is on the floor. Oh, sorry. Lost my way. No more comments or questions before we vote on the motion. Okay, looking for comments or questions. Otherwise, I'll reread the motion for everybody. Not seeing any more. So the motion that it's been moved and seconded is to direct the administration to proceed with the proposed hybrid in-person slash virtual meeting plan as presented and return to the city council with minor modifications to the city council rules of procedure to reflect the ability of the public to make comments virtually on an ongoing basis. And I'll turn it back over to the city clerk for a roll call vote. Beginning with council member Hall. Aye. Council president Hunt. Aye. Council member Walsh. Aye. Council member DeMichelle. Aye. Council member Goodman. Aye. That's five ayes, zero nays. Thank you. That passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda this evening is good of the order. And if you have something for good of the order, please indicate in the chat. And while I'm waiting to see if there's anything, I'll go over a couple of upcoming council meetings. So there will be a city council study session Tuesday, July 27th, with potential agenda items, including the sign code, city leadership and services update, um, municipal implementation, and the boards and commissions future meetings format. There is a city council special study session uh, on strategy and budget planning, a strategy and budget planning workshop on Friday, July 30th. Dinner will be provided for council members at 5.30 p.m. and the meeting will begin at 6 p.m. 
Can, you, can I confirm that that one is likely to be at Tibbetts Creek Manor or is it Council Chambers? Tibbetts Creek Manor. Thank you. And on August 2nd, the regular city council meeting will uh, potential agenda items including the revenue forecast, the recovery coordinator update uh, on the American Rescue Plan Act funding, Snoqualmie Tribe Ancestral Land Lands Movement update, and the establishment of the equity board. And I'm not seeing anything else for good of the order in the chat. So we will move on to our next item, which is an executive session. And as earlier mentioned, there will be an executive session held this evening to discuss uh, pending or potential litigation per RCW 42.30.110 paren 1 paren I, and the item is expected to last 20 minutes. No action is anticipated to follow in open session. As a reminder, executive sessions are closed to the public and we will now recess into the executive session at 8.35 p.m. And I'd ask the city clerk to move the city council into a separate session within this meeting. Anyone who is not part of the closed session will remain in the main, can, may remain in the main meeting. You are welcome to stay in the meeting until it is reconvened. Uh, so city clerk, are we um, removing attendees from the meeting? Yes, give me just one more moment. Thank you.